Padre Pio of Pietralcina, the monk who bore the wounds of Christ crucified, and like Christ, was a victim of persecution, the man who for 81 years lived in a state of sanctity. Padre Pio, you are now in the realm of the blessed, and from there it is easier to hear us. We are small compared to your greatness, but in this nothingness there is so much love, so much affection, so much devotion for you. We open the pages and begin. You were born of peasants, and your only richness was in your poverty. You wished to become a servant of God. Your parents consented, and you followed in the footsteps of the Divine Master, for whom you lived and suffered for more than 50 years, as you walked life's path strewn with thorns and roses. San Giovanni Rotondo on a feast day, high on Mount Gargano in the southern part of Italy, this small village has become world known because of the humble Capuchin monk, Padre Pio, who lived here for 52 years. Thousands of faithful followers have arrived from all parts of the world to pay homage to the good Padre. For many years in the past, these pilgrims traveled great distances just to spend a few days there, to attend his mass, or to confess their sins and receive his blessing. Padre, how you have transformed this tiny village into an oasis of spiritual refuge and prayer. How many of your devoted we meet in front of the church of Our Lady of Grace? Men, women, youngsters, nuns, priests, and so many children with their parents who hurry in answer to your call. The little ones were always your favorites and to them you gave your heart, your love, your blessings. The crowd is entering the church to attend high mass celebrated in your honor by an eminent cardinal. The choir raises its voice in prayer We well know that Holy Mass is celebrated in the same manner by all servants of the Lord, and the benefits derived by the faithful are identical. Yet, Padre Pio's Mass was entirely different. From the moment he entered the church at the sound of the bell, there was an electrifying effect and a moment of breathlessness. The praying crowd yearns to see him again, but in vain. He is gone. Suddenly the present seems to fade and through memory we go back in time and in our imagination we see Padre Pio again. As he approached the altar, compassion enveloped all those present as they knelt in reverence. From that moment all eyes were on him as he became immersed in the divine mystery of the Last Supper. How you were loved, Padre Pio. The love offered to you was a universal love, a sublime love that was shown more intensely by the poor, the suffering, the sick, the dying. How many died with your name on their lips because at that moment they felt your presence or could even see you as you came to help them 
on the road to expiation and the redemption of their souls. was a mystical fusion between the visible and the invisible. This was also shown when the blood from your wounds mingled in the chalice with that of Jesus Christ. Turning back the pages recalls Padre Pio's childhood in the tiny village of Pietrelcina, situated between Naples and San Giovanni Rotondo. In this mountain countryside, untouched by modern times, Padre Pio was born on May the 25th, 1887. On that day, only God knew that there had come into the world his messenger of love and peace and that one day he would relive the Calvary of Christ in a region blessed and protected by the Archangel St. Michael. The sandaled feet of a Capuchin monk softly thread their way towards a poor little house where he was born. His parents, Orazio and Giuseppina Forgione, were poor and illiterate, honest and religious. The day after his birth, he was baptized Francis at the Church of St. Mary of the Angels. At the age of five, he vowed to St. Francis of Assisi, the stigmatized friar, he would follow his example. At the age of 12, he was confirmed. At 16, in a celestial vision, the young Francis saw the span of his future existence. And five days later, entered the convent in Morcone. The Franciscan guide enters the house and with a sense of eagerness one begins to look and to ponder. Seeing this house, devoid of all furnishings, full of childhood memories, one feels in the air something that makes one gaze about everywhere. In this bare room, the chair where his mother sat and mended the children's clothing, and next to it, a rock, which many times served as a pillow for the boy practicing self-imposed penance to prepare himself for a life of sacrifice. Francis was a frail child. He suffered from debilitating fevers and already had signs of tuberculosis. He used to pray to the Madonna to guide his future. One night, Satan appeared to him in the form of a ferocious black dog. Terrified, the boy continued to pray and the infernal apparition took flight. Young Francis graduated from grammar school at the age of 10. The following year, his father decided to emigrate to America. He said goodbye to his beloved family and went to help build Brogolino, Brooklyn in the Neapolitan dialect. 
There he would earn better wages and assist his faithful wife in bringing up the family with the expenses of the boy's studies for the priesthood. Beyond lies the vast green terrain of the Piana Romana, with the elm tree where young Francis took refuge to speak with Jesus. There he would meditate, make crosses from sticks, kneel on the rocky ground to recite the rosary. Reliving the past, we see the path where he walked as a child. Ahead of him lay a life of abstinence and obedience. The cobbled street leads to where Francis was baptized. How he must have felt when he left his birthplace to enter the service of the Lord. Farewell, old bell tower, whose sounds echoed through the woods and called me to prayer. Farewell. Here at the age of 21, a seminarian in the year 1908. In the city of Benevento, he was ordained to Padre Pio on August the 10th, 1910. In the year 1916, Padre Pio was sent to San Giovanni Rotondo, the church of Our Lady of Grace, as it stood isolated above the still peaceful valley. Here the saintliness of the young priest soon became known. Peasants and farmers brought the fruits of their labor and their animals to be blessed. The humble monk heard the sins of his penitents in a way no other priest had done. He brought peace to them and soon lines were forming outside the convent. Even businessmen came to him and received his blessing for future projects. On September the 20th, 1918, occurred the most important event in the life of Padre Pio. It was on that day that he received the five wounds of Christ crucified. The Holy Friar found himself pierced in his hands, his feet, and in his side. The Holy Stigmate. Physically weakened, he made his own way back to his cell, soaked in his own blood. Mary is the inspiration of my hope. And thus, for 50 years, Padre Pio became a living crucifix to shed his blood for the sins of humanity. The news of the stigmate spread, and in 1919, thousands of pilgrims flocked to see Padre Pio. But he was also subjected to medical examinations by scientists and doctors, anxious to disprove their divine origin. Their probings revealed further that the organ of his heart had been divided, known medically as transverberation. The ordeal was kept up for four years until in June 1923 came the order that he must celebrate mass alone in a private chapel and he was forbidden to answer letters. One week later, 3,000 persons threatened violent action and the next day he returned to their church. And then after eight years of litigation, the order was repeated and he was suspended from his ministry with the exception of mass in private. And so the Calvary on earth began for Padre Pio. He found himself a prisoner. Our hearts reach out for hope and confidence. We pray to his divine heart that he may embrace us closer to his heart. And we will try and reciprocate such great love because love is paid with love. He celebrated in private in the small chapel and his masses lasted from three to four hours. During that time, he spoke with Jesus, with St. Michael, with the Madonna, with St. Francis. For two years, he was placed in solitude because of his immense love for humanity. Prisoner, 
because of the blood he shed daily from his wounds. Prisoner for his deep faith. Prisoner because he was loved. Prisoner because people came from the far corners of the world to ask for his prayers. And even because he was judged the most photographed person in the world. Padre Pio, you have understood well the workings of man. And from where you are now, you can best judge. On July the 6th, 1933, Padre Pio celebrated Mass once more in public. In March 1934, Padre Pio received permission to hear confessions. of the same year, the permission was extended to include women. The roses bloomed again. With tears of happiness, he returned to his people, who never would betray or cease to love him. Not far from the Church of Our Lady of Grace, stands a large house that for over 44 years was a haven of hospitality for pilgrims visiting Padre Pio. Here lived Mary Pyle, a simple, humble American woman. Mary was born in New York of a wealthy Protestant family. At an early age, she felt an attraction towards the spiritual values as a fundamental necessity in her life. She was converted to Catholicism in the same year that Padre Pio received the stigmate and decided to visit San Giovanni Rotondo. She arrived there in 1923 and there she stayed, living for others. Under Padre Pio's spiritual guidance, she became a member of the Third Order of St. Francis. She dedicated herself to the seraphic virtues and evangelical counsels, to the practice of prayer, chastity, and a deep love for her fellow men. But Mary's days were not restricted to spiritual contemplations. In her humble house, during her years at San Giovanni Rotondo, she answered letters regarding Padre Pio, sending advice, promises of prayers, and his blessings. She organized the women's choir, and her philanthropic works knew no bounds. In her desire to please Padre Pio, Mary invited his parents to live in her house. It was here in January 1929 that Padre Pio wept and wept for his beloved mother's death. His tears brought puzzlement to those who asked of him why so saintly a man should be moved so. His reply was, they are tears of joy. Orazio Forgione remained until 1946 when his earthly life ended. At his side, assisting him in his last hours, was his devoted son, Padre Pio. Since the death of Mary Pyle in the spring of 1968, pilgrims continue to visit her home, remembering the many peaceful hours spent with her. Padre Pio's golden anniversary as a servant of God was celebrated on August the 10th, 1960, in front of the Home for the Relief of Suffering, a jubilant occasion with thousands of his followers present. For many years, the Holy Mass of the stigmatized priest had been the center of life in San Giovanni Rotondo.
the holy monk of the Gargano thanked all those present and the millions of friends who remembered him by extending his paternal blessing. Over and above the graces dispensed to mankind, within the heart of Padre Pio there was a treasure of virtue that brought out his greatness before God. The love that radiated from his person, from his profound black eyes, and from his humility, was the reflection of an infinite beauty. To understand this, we need only to observe him once, as he held the blessed sacrament in his holy hands. Here he found his great love, the love that made him saintly. Before the Eucharist, his enraptured soul prompted him to give voice to the most ardent prayers. Those moments were beautiful because they enriched him with graces and he spread them to others as he walked the path that leads to sanctity. The love for the Blessed Sacrament lit up his heart and gave him ardor for his apostolate and charity for his fellow men. For this charity, Padre Pio replied for each tear with a grace. For each soul, he sought above all its eternal salvation. Padre Pio's devotion to the Madonna was immense. Here in the sacristy is the statue that was donated by Portugal. How many beads passed through his fingers during his lifetime, it would be impossible to imagine. But with each one, he plucked a painful thorn from humanity. Each rosary took suffering from the afflicted and brought peace to the just. Francesco Morcaldi, who was mayor of San Giovanni Rotondo for more than 25 years and one of the first of the spiritual sons of Padre Pio, recalls the event that occurred on August the 7th, 1959. Of my many memories during the 50 years I lived so close to Padre Pio, the kindliest figure of our century, there is one particular incident which I hold dear. In April 1959, the whole world was apprehensive for the health of Padre Pio, who was, according to his doctors, hopelessly ill. Then, through the efforts of the people of San Giovanni Rotondo and Cardinal Lercaro, we were given hope and joy, the promise of a visit to our village, of the statue of Our Lady of Fatima, which was traveling through all the cities of Italy to invoke peace among mankind and ask relief for the whole world, which had been so shaken by terrible upheavals. 
the Madonina of Fatima arrived and descended gently in front of the large church where the kneeling crowd gave her their homage and their hearts. Padre Pio had been ill since April, but he insisted on getting to his feet and coming right down to the feet of the Madonna to bring her his anxieties and his hopes and to ask a blessing for himself and for the world. Very slowly, he descended the long and difficult stairway of the convent. He was supported by two brothers, and they had to stop several times. Then he kneeled, kissed the feet of the Madonna, and made an offering of a white dove and a gold rosary given by the faithful of Florence. On the following day, the Madonnina rose to the skies to continue the visits in Italy. And the suffering father gazed out from his window and spoke to her. Madonna, you have been in Italy only three months. You came here when I was ill, and now you leave us while I'm still ill. Those words I heard standing behind Father with many other people of San Giovanni Rotondo, and they resounded in our hearts. But the Madonna rose into the heavens. At that very moment, Padre Pio felt a tremor of new life. He found he was able to take up again his mission of love and brotherhood for all the faithful who come to San Giovanni Rotondo from all over Italy and the world. Long live our Madonnina of Fatima, our Madonna of Grace. Long live our Madonna, whoever descends into every corner of the earth and unites innocent souls to plead with people for prayer and penance. And she will restore the great peace which is Christ and is also the peace of all nations and of all people. On the top terrace of the hospital is the figure of the Archangel St. Michael. Padre Pio had a great devotion to the Prince of the Heavenly Hosts and urged pilgrims to visit the Holy Grotto a few miles from San Giovanni Rotondo. To participate in the festivities is to join the faithful who mount the slopes of Mount Sant'Angelo to visit the temple where stands the golden statue of St. Michael majestic and triumphant. The first apparition of St. Michael took place on May the 8th in the year 490 under the pontificate of Pope Felice III when the Archangel announced that he was the protector of Mount Gargano. Bishop Lorenzo Majorano established that on the 29th of September of each year the faithful celebrate the feast of St. Michael. Descending these time-worn steps, one arrives in the subterranean cave where St. Michael made four apparitions. Lining the walls of primitive paintings are interspersed many testimonies of the miracles attributed to the Prince of Heavenly Hosts. In the year 1656, when a plague claimed thousands of victims, St. Michael appeared in all his glory to the Archbishop Puccinelli and assured him the plague would end if the faithful gathered within the grotto to pray and take home as relics pieces of stone from the temple. This was manifested by the disappearance of the plague. O oh, resplendent and glorious Archangel St. Michael, eternal chalice, reflector of the infinite light, 
Turn thine eyes below to our world, so invaded by immorality and evil. Thou who conquered Satan and his cohorts, take up thy sword once again, and from the heights of thy mountain, cast the evil spirits away, and protect us from dangers that threaten the peace of the world. It is said St. Francis came here on a pilgrimage, and feeling unworthy to enter the Holy Grotto, he remained in prayer for an entire night outside, his head resting on a stone. Tradition tells us that the imprint of his features has remained through the centuries on the stone. Traveling along the countryside in the mountainous region of the Gargano, one senses its atmosphere of peace and tranquility. With the remembrance of the poor man of Assisi and with a feeling of goodness, the pilgrims returned to Padre Pio and San Giovanni Rotondo, the village that has been blessed by his saintliness and presence for so many years. The expressions of Padre Pio were a mirror, reflecting his mysterious inner self as he came into contact with others. It was forbidden to photograph him, and for that reason the following scenes are precious indeed. We see him smiling, his hands folded, pensive. In deep thought while vesting for the celebration of the mass, then an expression of doubt. Now he averts his glance, his penetrating eyes seem to have discovered a grave truth. And then melancholy. In deep meditation and prayer, kneeling before the altar of the beloved Archangel St. Michael, Padre Pio's life was devoted to constant prayer from early morning. During thanksgiving following mass, he seemed to be with God alone. He prayed throughout the day until the recitation of the rosary at Vespers in the choir loft under the merciful glance of the Madonna. One recalls an occasion when he paused to pray in the main church in the presence of a large group of faithful who knelt immobile as if fearful of interrupting the good father's meditation. Rare and unusual are the following glimpses of Padre Pio within the cloistered privacy of the convent, seen here in a meeting with his superior. In the refectory, during dinner with his fellow monks. A moment of relaxation, having a hair trim. Inside the veranda, fingering one of the many rosaries which he recited frequently. Padre Pio did not appear serious or brusque at all times. We have surprised him in his typical humoristic moments, for on occasion he liked to jest and provoke laughter. In fact, he had fun with his brothers, happy in their acceptance of his humor. How many times in his lifetime Padre Pio wept. We recall these sorrowful and emotional moments which he experienced on the altar. This touching scene expresses his humility while present at a mass offered in his honor. Alone in his cell, reading the letters which were directed to him from many parts of the world, pausing at length upon these letters, filled with sorrow. In his humility, he felt helpless in the face of the gravity of their problems. It was truly a relief for the saintly monk to weep at the immense joy he felt while offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Padre Pio knew how to address his devoted followers, giving spiritual counsel or advice on the conduct of their daily lives, showering graces and benedictions in his path to the poor, the tormented souls, to the sinners. Padre Pio was most happy when he came in contact with those most dear to him, the children his cherished ones.
for whom he displayed his joy at having them near him to embrace and kiss them. The presence of those small creatures of God gave relief to his suffering. He bore a resemblance to their pure and innocent childhood and he bestowed many graces upon them. He welcomed them in his garden. Here he experienced his apostolate, a mission which only saints achieve. May the hand of Padre Pio be a warning to souls who have strayed and to those who have lost their way, traveling on a road marked by hatred and violence. From these divine features may words of tolerance, goodness and mercy spread throughout the world. This is the hand that forgave and blessed, that led hardened sinners to the path of enlightenment. One day, Padre Pio stood at the window of the old church and spoke to his followers gathered below of his impending death. Above all, Jesus on the cross had said, all is finished. Likewise should we do. When our day comes, we can say, all is consummated in the service of God. Now I can sing with the old Simeon. Allow, O oh Lord, that your servant may come to join you. One rainy afternoon, he went out from the convent for what was to be perhaps the last time. Like all citizens of San Giovanni Rotondo, he went to the polls to vote. During the last two years of his life, when growing weakness incapacitated him, Padre Pio's superiors gave him a wheelchair to transport him within the confines of the convent. There was constant movement in the sacristy, the Hall of St. Francis, and the various corridors. His faithful knelt in reverence to enjoy a glimpse of him, hand him a note, touch his garments, or to kiss his holy hand. Scenes of love and devotion that cannot be described. It was the day commemorating 50 years of thorns and roses. September the 20th, 1968. Half a century had passed since the day when Padre Pio received the wounds of Christ crucified. From all over the world, his followers and spiritual children came to celebrate this important milestone in the life of the holy monk. Prayer group leaders spoke to those gathered, extolling the saintly monk's virtues and bringing him the good wishes of those unable to attend. For one and all, there was that smile of Padre Pio, who in just three days would be with them no longer. For 50 years, he walked a path strewn with thorns, suffering, bitterness, abstinence, tears, yet full of love and obedience. During these anniversary celebrations, the first stone of the monumental Way of the Cross was placed and blessed, a project he long dreamed of by Padre Pio. Below the Church of Our Lady of Grace, Padre Pio's tomb was blessed just 16 hours before his death.
These few scenes are from Padre Pio's last mass. Here, the man, racked by physical weakness and suffering, continues to force his frail, depleted body beyond endurance. Father, as you began your climb of the altar steps, assisted by your brothers, you seemed to stagger. In that brief moment, what must you have experienced? That you would not be able to carry on? But yet another moment of physical setback has been overcome, and you are able to continue until you begin to say your last mass. pierced our hearts at the deathly pallor of your hands placed over the chalice for the oblation. Then the consecration and the elevation. What an effort to find the strength to continue, to consecrate another drop of Christ's blood, to renew your feeble body with your own almost empty veins. overtaxed your remaining strength with this last mass and suddenly you fall unresisting as if precipitated into the pit of death with this last sad impression in our minds we leave you still alive but we were never to see you alive again Padre Pellegrino, the superior of the convent, recounts the last hours of Padre Pio. It was ten minutes after nine on the evening of September the 22nd, 1968, when Padre Pio called me from his cell next to mine for the first time that evening. I found him turned toward the room with tears in his eyes. But they are sweet tears. I dried his lashes, asking him what he would do, and left. Sometimes he calls me back the second, third, and fourth time, and sometimes he even finds the courage to joke with me. Instead of saying, Father Pellegrino, my son, my brother, as he was wont to say, that evening he said, Don Pellegrino. When he wanted to joke, that is how he spoke. But despite his joking, it seemed that he wanted me to sit beside him. I did so, and he began to tremble like a child, and asked me the time every few minutes. He persisted in this as if he had an appointment with someone. He made no comments on the time. At a quarter after midnight, he asked me, Well, have you celebrated the Mass? And again, My lad, have you said Mass? So I replied, spiritual father, it's still too early to celebrate mass. He said, well, my son, this morning you will say mass for me. A little later, he asked me to hear his confession. Immediately afterwards, he said, listen, my son, if God should call me to him, please ask all our brethren to forgive me for all the trouble I have given them. And please, all of you, my brethren and spiritual sons, say a prayer for my soul. I answered him rather sharply. Listen to me, spiritual father. I assure you, you still have a long time to live. 
he was very hurt by my manner. And by way of asking his forgiveness, I said, Spiritual Father, if you should be right, may I ask of you at least a last blessing for your brethren, for your spiritual sons, and for all your sick ones. He answered, Yes, I bless them all. But I ask the superior to be so kind as to give me his blessing. He then wanted to renew his religious vows. At this I was really disturbed, because this ceremony we never perform except on our deathbed. I had heard his confession many times, but he had never asked to renew his religious vows. Then I noticed that his lips were becoming pale, which frightened me. And so I started to go and call someone for help, but he said, no, don't disturb anyone. I tried to leave anyway, but he called me back two or three times. Finally, I said in a very positive manner, Spiritual Father, I think that you are very ill, and so I should call someone to help me. I ran off and called Fra Giuseppe Pio, who at that time was known as Bill, Bill Martin, an American. Bill came right away, and I went to telephone to Dr. Sala. The doctor arrived in about 15 minutes, and as soon as he saw him, he also thought it was a case of his usual bronchial asthma attacks. We prepared the injection given to him at such times, and when Bill and I went to raise him for the injection, it was impossible to lift him. Padre Pio had given up the struggle. We had to carry him to his bed where the injection was given him, after which we again placed him in the armchair, the doctor thinking that he would breathe better there. I prepared some coffee and gave him some. He had the strength to take it, but not to swallow it. Evidently, his throat had begun to contract. I thought perhaps that he might be having a mucus crisis, which could have impeded his breathing. So I suggested to the doctor that we call for the air tent. But the doctor knew that it was not a question of mucus, but of something much more serious. About 10 minutes later, the doctor noticed that Padre Pio was not reacting to the injection, and so we hastened to call the superiors, all of the brethren, Dr. Gusso, Dr. Scarale, two or three of the nurses from the hospital, and his nephew, Mario Penelli. Finally, they all arrived. In the meantime, Brother Paolo, the sacristan, had prepared for the ministration of the sacrament of extreme unction. We were all gathered around Father, praying, while the doctors were trying to give him oxygen, first through a tube and then with an oxygen mask. But unfortunately, it was all of no avail. At half past two, Padre Pio, without a contraction, without any brusque movement, his hands still entwined around his rosary, and the words, Jesus, Mary, on his lips, gently bowed his head and passed into the arms of his creator. of mourning, some 200,000 persons passed before the casket of Padre Pio, which was exposed to the faithful inside the Church of Our Lady of Grace.
Like Jesus, he was pierced in his side, his hands, his feet. He was scourged by lies, unjustly accused, and his heart was rent. Was Pietrelcina another Bethlehem? Was the tragedy of Golgotha enacted once again in San Giovanni Rotondo? we see you facing the heavens as though praying that strength may be given to us to face the emptiness of tomorrow. earthly remains will be lowered into the crypt. Lifting up our heads, we search the blue and endless sky for some sign of you. In search of your face, at times morose but always good. In search of your piercing black eyes, ready to condemn but always ready to forgive. Your voice. How can we forget it? Your words of encouragement when beset by anxiety and doubt, we turned to you for the help we so badly needed. We'll never see you again. Few of us are worthy of your apparitions, the sweet smell of your mystical perfume, of the wonder of your miraculous cures. It remains for us to pray. Pray also for the day of your sanctification. That will make us especially happy. In every altar we shall be present, beseeching God. And you will be there, listening intently, because you knew us well on this earth. You knew our problems, our needs, and you knew too that in this world, there is little true love between people, between nations. A pure, unselfish love that could do so much to remove fear and distrust and bind all in a universal brotherhood of man. 
You knew this when, martyred and persecuted, you walked in the peaceful confines of your garden. Turn again, Padre Pio, once again, your eyes towards us sinners. Intercede for us through Mary, our Immaculate Mother, and ask her to purify our souls that we may be worthy of God's help in our struggle against sin and temptation so that someday we shall stand before the throne of the Omnipotent with a pure, unspotted soul and see you again, Padre Pio, to enjoy the radiance of your smile, your embrace, your love, and your forgiveness.